uh, uh, got it here. Yeah. So uh, uh, I will uh, talk on some classical geometric problem, the so-called Bonnet problem. And uh, the question which uh, I'm going to uh, answer is whether a surface uh, is characterized by its metric and curvatures. So, and we are talking about uh, usual surfaces and about usual space, yeah? Two-dimensional surfaces and three-dimensional space. Uh, uh, I will uh, demonstrate that uh, this is very much related to our various integrable systems and the theory of integrable systems helps to uh, solve the problem. So uh, first, uh, let me start uh, with uh, some uh, very short differential geometry lecture one theory of surfaces. So uh, we are going to treat surfaces analytically and therefore we start with uh, con conformally parameterized surfaces. W well, maybe maybe uh, I, I will start uh, more general, yeah? So the question is how to describe surfaces in two dimensional space? How much uh, uh, characteristic, how much uh, functions or how, how, how much information uh, is required for this? So, uh, uh, but uh, to formulate this uh, uh, as a real mathematical problem, let me explain your uh, the analytical description or, of surfaces uh, we are dealing with, yeah? And then I will formulate the problem. So uh, every, any, every surface in R3 can be conformally parameterized. So this means uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, a parameterization like this, so u and v are conformal coordinates and 2h e to the 2h is a conformal factor of your metric. And of course, uh, uh, the most important thing is this complex coordinate z, which is u plus iv. First and second fundamental forms are rather simple in this case. So the first fundamental form is uh, uh, proportional to one, it's conformal. And the second fundamental form uh, has uh, uh, two uh, extra coefficients, which are the mean curvature value, h, and uh, the so-called Hopf differential, which is explained here. It's the second derivative of f uh, with respect to z times n, the scalar product. And from here, you see that q is not a function, but a quadratic differential on our Riemann surface, which we uh, are conformally immersing into R3. So then uh, classical uh, uh, stuff. So this, the curvature, the mean, uh, the metric and the Hopf differential should satisfy the Gauss-Kadatz equation, nonlinear partial differential equations written here. Uh, and uh, uh, provided you have a solution to these equations, uh, you have a surface. So given a metric, a quadratic differential and mean curvature function satisfying the Gauss-Kadatz, uh, there exists an immersion with the corresponding fundamental forms. So it's not uh, a story about our Riemann surface, it's a story about the universal covering. So it's not clear whether uh, the surface uh, will be as periodic as our Riemann surface, but uh, that's the, uh, the classical Bonnet theorem, which uh, allows us to describe surfaces analytically. And if you look at this, then you see it's a, uh, highly overdetermined systems, you have many functions and they should satisfy nonlinear equations. And the question is whether they are all really required, yeah? Whether uh, it's possible to reduce the number of uh, functions that are used uh, here to characterize your surface. So it's quite a natural question uh, whether all these data, the metric, the Hopf differential, and the mean curvature are required. Uh, also, uh, we all know that uh, the Gaussian curvature is uh, determined by the metric. Therefore, uh, when we are talking about curvatures, we are talking about only mean curvature. So all about principal curvatures, which is the same in this case. So which is not determined by the metric. And the question is, do the metric and the curvatures determine the surface? And if we are in general position, then uh, the answer is yes. And this is, uh, of course, the problem which was treated uh, already by classics. And uh, already Bonnet himself knew 
that uh, generally the answer is yes, but there are exceptional cases. And these are these three cases, we, all of them known to Bonnet. These are surfaces with constant mean curvature. These are so-called Bonnet pairs when you have exactly two surfaces with, uh, that are isometric and have the same mean curvature function at the corresponding points. And also so-called Bonnet families when you have not only two surfaces, but one parameter family of surfaces and the curvature is not constant, non-constant uh, CMC surfaces. So in all three cases, you can treat this uh, problem locally and globally, looking at equations and looking at uh, compact examples. Uh, and all three cases are described by integrable systems. The cases are different, the integrable systems are different. And so I will mention all of them. Uh, so the last case of Banner families is uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the closest to the topic of this uh, conference because uh, it is related to Pendlevier equations and to isomododromic deformations. Uh, but I will mostly uh, talk about Bonnet pairs where we have two surfaces, also integrable systems are involved and we have uh, new interesting results uh, in this case. So, okay, but let me start with the first example uh, constant mean curvature surfaces. In this case, uh, the corresponding isometric uh, family is very simple. You just multiply the, the Hopf differential by a unitary constant, and that's the family. Uh, we all uh, know why this constant is called lambda in this slide, because it's a spectral parameter in the corresponding Lux representation of the corresponding nonlinear equation which is written here in uh, to uh, left uh, down, uh, it's an elliptic sinh Gordon equation. So, uh, well, about uh, 30 years ago, there was some big progress in, uh, in the description of global CMC surfaces. In particular, all uh, examples were found, then all tori were classified using the theory of integrable systems, and uh, they were explicitly uh, described. So this is not the case uh, I'm going to talk about. Yeah. So uh, currently uh, there is also progress in description of uh, higher genus uh, examples and higher genus theory, which is related to the theory of sine gordon equation on the Riemann surface. So let us uh, go to our next case, the case of Banet pairs. What is this? A Banet pair uh, is two congruent, non-congruent isometric surfaces, which are denoted by F plus and F minus, with the same mean curvature at corresponding points. That's simple. Uh, what is uh, known about this? So why two? Because if you have three, then Laus and Tributz have proven that you have a one parameter family. And that's the third case, which we'll uh, hopefully uh, have time to uh, mention at the end of this uh, talk. So uh, uh, we will concentrate ourselves on these two cases. And uh, this means that they exist, if we are interested in compact examples, then there exist at most two compact immersions. So the one problem we are going to investigate here is, do there exist compact Banet pairs? So additionally to this condition that they're isometric and have the same mean curvature, they're compact. So that's the question. So, um, well, uh, I think it was not uh, quite clear what to expect in this case, whether they, they probably exist or they probably do not exist, yeah? So at least uh, there were papers and claims retracted later that they do not exist. Uh, and also there were sufficient conditions uh, found for non-existence. So there were works uh, directed in the direction that uh, to prove that they don't exist. So it was not clear at least, yeah? So uh, uh, let us first look at the case of, uh, uh, of uh, spheres. Okay, so we have uh, a smooth Banet pair 
both surfaces are isometric. It's the same conformal parameterization, the same Riemann surface in the background with the common metric, common mean curvature function, and two different pop differentials. So let us denote them by Q plus and Q min, Q minus. So if you look at the Kadatsi equations, then you will immediately observe that the difference of these two quadratic differentials, which is denoted QH here, is holomorphic. So the differentials Q plus and Q minus are not holomorphic. They uh, depend on the mean curvature and so on. But the difference between them is holomorphic. But then the next step is quite simple. If you are on the sphere, then you know that there are no quadratic holomorphic differentials on the sphere, and therefore this QH must vanish identically. And this means that uh, these uh, two surfaces have the same hop, differ hop differential, and this means that they have the same uh, quadratic forms and they are congruent. So, uh, there exists no Bonnet pairs of genus zero. That's uh, quite simple. Also, if you look uh, at this problem of, on, of all its generality, in all its generality, then you should investigate also umbilic points because they uh, describe singularities of equations and uh, are very important. So it turns out that these umbilic points coincide with the zero divisor of this quadratic holomorphic differential, which is again the difference of the of the top. Okay, now uh, the next uh, question is uh, uh, whether there exist Banet pairs of genus one. This is of course much easier than the case of higher genus. So we see that there are no umbilic points because uh, the quadratic differential doesn't vanish on the torus. And therefore, uh, these quadratic, uh, uh, these pop differentials, Q plus and Q minus, can be represented in uh, such a way, alpha plus minus I, the imaginary part can be normalized to be a constant, uh, where alpha is some smooth function. And it's a smooth function on a torus. The gauss kadatsi equations of banet tori are written here. Now you have three real valued functions, h uh, small, which is the metric, h capital, which is the mean curvature, and alpha, which is this rest of the pop differentials. So all of them are real valued, and all of them are on tori. So it must be double periodic. So what you uh, could do, you can solve these gauss kadatsi equations written here, solve then the frame equations, and after that, find doubly periodic emergence. So if you do this, then of course you have a Bonnet pair. So, and I should say that uh, this is not the way to solve the problem. Yeah, because, well, you, you can't follow this way. Yeah? So not clear how. So uh, I will explain you, uh, yeah, first, that's the result. These uh, Bonnet pairs of genus one do exist. Uh, this is an example. You have, uh, you see here two tori. Uh, they are isometric. They have the same mean curvature function, which is not constant in this case, but coincide uh, for both surfaces at the corresponding points. Uh, the surfaces are not embedded. They are immersed. You see, they have a lot of self intersections. But also, you can see from these pictures they they are tori. Yeah, you see even the both holes. So, but this hole uh, of the surface to the right of the right surface is a little bit larger and these bubbles, they are a little bit further apart. And uh, therefore these two th uh, surfaces are not congruent. Also, they look a little bit similar. So you see two lines here, uh, blue and uh, uh, orange. They are two generators on, on, on the tori. They do correspond. The blue lines are planar and congruent. The orange uh, lines uh, are not uh, congruent and not planar. Okay, now uh, that's the result. And so now I'm going to explain you uh, how, to, uh, how to get it. So uh, I forgot to say that uh, 
this uh, work on compact Banet pairs is a joint work uh, with Tim Hoffman and with Zangeman uh, 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 Furnas. So uh, there is a preprint in archive. Uh, first, I should introduce the notion of uh, isothermic surfaces, which will play an important role in this uh, geometry. Isothermic surfaces, they are surfaces that can be conformally parameterized by their curvature lines. So any surface can be conformally parameterized, any surface can be curvature line parameterized, but there is a special class of surfaces, rather large, but special, that can be uh, conformally parameterized by their curvature lines. So um, it's, uh, uh, they can be characterized by this property, the mixed derivative, uh, lies in the uh, tangent plane, and this Hopf differential is a real value if you have an isothermic parameterization. Geometrically, this means that uh, curvature lines separate your uh, surface in infinitesimal squares. So that's a geometric intuition uh, behind this. So if you have uh, I'm going to use these isometric surfaces and their relation to Bonnet pairs. Uh, as soon as you have an isothermic surface, there exists also a so-called dual isothermic surface, which is uh, defined here. Uh, you uh, divide uh, their tangent vectors by uh, their square of the metric. Uh, so this means that their length of the tangent vectors is one over, and also negate their uh, sign, uh, reverse the sign of, uh, in one direction. Of course, you can do whatever you want, but it turns out that uh, this is, again, a closed form, and it defines us another isothermic surface, which is called the dual. It's an involution. Since uh, this uh, map, to the isotherm dual isothermic surface is defined for one forms, it doesn't respect the periodicity conditions. So the periodicity properties are not respected. If you have a closed uh, isothermic surface, then uh, there is no guarantee that the dual one also will be closed. So if you take a torus, for example, which is iso uh, isothermic and dualize it, then usually you get just a universal covering. Yeah, so a quasi periodic. Uh, uh, surface. So what is important for us also that to come to uh, Bonnet surfaces from here, you should use a quaternionic description of surfaces because the relation is algebraic and highly non-trivial and uh, it's difficult, uh, if possible at all, uh, possible but very difficult and inconvenient to describe this in terms of usual three-dimensional vectors and three-dimensional space. So now we describe our surfaces as imaginary quaternions. So if you want, they are just, uh, well, SU2 matrices in, uh, uh, in the Lie algebra. Yeah, so three-dimensional uh, vector space, which is identified with the space of imaginary quaternions. So then the same relation, for the dual surface can be written this way. You take a few and a few, which are now imaginary quaternions, invert them and build this form and the form turns out to be closed. Okay, so uh, now it was some uh, information about isothermic surfaces, which I'm going to use. And the next slide is really uh, very important. So it, is, it explains the relation between isothermic surfaces and Banet pairs. So it turns out that you can describe Banet pairs completely in terms of isothermic surfaces. So that's a result of uh, Camber of Petit Pinker, already 20 years old, uh, and it's a local result. It's a result for simply connected domains. So, but that's uh, the result which we are going to use. So let us look uh, here. So these immersions, F plus and F minus, from a simply connected domain, 
to imaginary quaternions, which we identify with three dimensional space, build a binary pair if and only if they exist in isothermic surface, again, as a map from D to imaginary quaternions, and some real number such that this formula holds. Now let us look at this formula. Uh, this formula describes us two frames, two quaternionic frames, DF plus and DF minus, and they are closed and uh, they define us two surfaces. And the claim is that these two surfaces will be isometric and will have the same mean curvature function. So now let us look at the right-hand side. And you see, we start with the surface F, which is an isothermic surface, construct the dual one form, the uh, one form uh, of, the, of the dual isothermic surface. And then we multiply quaternions like this, yeah? So all three entries here in this product are imaginary quaternions. Okay, this uh, uh, two are not imaginary, but the, uh, the one in the middle is an imaginary quaternion. And these are uh, two full quaternions. And the claim is, if I take an isothermic surface and uh, do this, then I will get a Banach pair. And I get it locally. So for a simply connected, uh, for simply connected domain. Moreover, I take all of them this way if they don't have umbilic points. So that's the result uh, of Cambier of Pedit Pinfeld. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, an old research, so there are uh, related results uh, obtained even by Bianchi, who has found also a relation to isothermic surfaces in S3. So, but that's uh, the modern result, which is very important uh, for this talk and for our research. Okay, now the things uh, get a little bit more complicated. So, as I said, this is a local theory. And uh, let us look, uh, what are we going to get? So first of all, we start with uh, some isothermic surface. Uh, the surface should be already a torus because you see the surface itself appears here in this formula. So if it's not closed, then th there is no chance to get something uh, periodic. So after that, we get D, uh, so we should start with an isothermic torus and many conditions should be satisfied. So if I take this formula and compute the periods of my uh, Bonaire surfaces, then they should be closed for both surfaces, for F plus and for F minus. So these are the periodicity conditions and that's, uh, these conditions make this problem uh, difficult. So let us look at these uh, conditions. Uh, and uh, okay, of course, our torus is just a fractor of a complex plane with uh, letters. And uh, we take a cycle that is closed on the isothermic surface. The corresponding curves are closed on the Banach pair if and only if two conditions are satisfied. This is so-called A periodicity condition, which is simpler, and B periodicity condition, which is uh, more difficult. So. Essentially, uh, they come from the linear uh, and quadratic, uh, from uh, terms of order epsilon to the zero and epsilon squared, and from the term of epsilon uh, in this representation. So uh, I, I think it's uh, not necessary to look, uh, uh, to investigate them now in all details. I will see how to simplify them and what do we get at the end. But they are ex essentially the periodicity conditions which we get from this formula. So first observation is parameter epsilon is not essential, so you can forget it. Uh, and also isothermic surfaces are maybe invariant, therefore you can play with this maybe symmetry a little bit. Now, the first important observation. Uh, so we have seen already that's important to have F in isothermic torus. But then the next condition could be you dualize it and the dual surface is also a torus. Moreover, F inverse is also a torus because it's a uh, Möbius transformation and the class of uh, isothermic surfaces is, is Möbius invariant. And you may ask the, or the second condition that F R, my inverse dual is also a torus. So if this happens, and these are very uh, elegant conditions which are rather easy to control, 
then the aperiodicity condition for Bernier pairs is satisfied for any cycle. So you see the this uh, expression, this integral expression can be integrated and that's the integral. So, and as soon as these surfaces exist as closed surfaces, we have uh, this uh, condition satisfied. So for any cycle, uh, you come back to the point on your surface. So it's not a big deal to work with this uh, aperiodicity condition. So, but now it's not quite clear what to do with the second one. And uh, now we jump to a completely different world. And I will show you how discrete differential geometry can be helpful to study classical smooth problems in classical differential geometry. So uh, we don't know what to do with the second condition and how to get these uh, surfaces. And then the idea is, let us do some numerics. So, but how to do numerics and how, what are your parameters? Yeah, so what, uh, what can you uh, use? So your parameter is this isothermic surface F, which you can choose whatever you want, but that's uh, too big, this space. Yeah, so it's, uh, there are many functional freedoms. So, and then the idea is to discretize all the problem. And we remember that we have a very natural notion of discrete isothermic surfaces. These are uh, described as uh, circular nets. So you have quadrilaterals. So this is a map of, of Z2 to imaginary quaternions, if you want, or to R3. And the properties are quite simple. Uh, so you have elementary quadrilaterals. They are not even plain, not only planar, but even circular. And moreover, the cross ratios are equal to minus one. Cross ratio equal to minus one means that uh, your quadrilateral is, uh, is a conformal square. There is a Möbius uh, transformation of the standard square there. So, and uh, long time ago, this uh, notion of discrete uh, isothermic nets was introduced uh, jointly with uh, Pinker. Uh, because it's quite natural and it was quite natural discretization of curvature lines and of conformal parametrization. So the idea is now to take this discrete isothermic surface and try to uh, discretize this formula for Bonnet pairs and look what happens. So this discretization of the formula for Bonnet pairs uh, was uh, made also several years ago by uh, uh, Hoffman, Zagerman, Furnas, Vardetsky. That's essentially the same formula, but it's slightly different. Yeah. So what's the difference? So when you are in the smooth world, so then uh, all these three ingredients in this formula are sitting at the same point. You have your one form at this point, and you have your immersion formula at this point, and you have, uh, yeah, and then you do this computation at this point. In the discrete case, the thing in the middle is already an edge. So, and therefore, when you gauge it from the right and from the left, you should take the surface uh, uh, immersion, the surface coordinates that are here, yeah? So, and they're different to the right and to the, to the left. Therefore, uh, natural discretization of the formula is this one, and you see that the left and the right-hand side do not coincide. So they are taken at uh, different uh, vertices of your layers. You have an edge in between, some gauging with your surface here and some gauging with your surface here. And for this gauging, you use the coordinates of your isothermic surface at these two points. So, and then it turns out that if you do this, you have an edge or you have two edges, the edge of the surface F plus and the edge of the surface F minus. And both surfaces are closed locally. So uh, then uh, the only thing you should do is to analyze the global periods. And now uh, let me show you what happens. So the natural idea is let us start with an isothermic torus, maybe with just a few points, and we will treat these points as periods, as parameters, sorry. And then we will vary them and try 
trying to get all the periodicity conditions solved. This is purely a numerical thing. Yeah, so it's not clear how to do this. The functionals you are minimizing in this case are definitely non-convex, and it's a, it's a lot of, uh, well, uh, uh, handwork how to get such a surface. But it turns out that uh, you can do this, and that's the result. And if you see this result, you think it's a mess. Yeah, so this is a discrete isothermic torus, uh, which is uh, five times seven letters, as few points as possible. But still, uh, if you do this and apply this discrete uh, Bonnet formula, then you get two Bonnet surfaces, discrete Bonnet surfaces closed. Well, it's uh, an interesting observation, but not more than that, probably at that uh, stage. But uh, what is interesting, uh, well, and that's the corresponding Bonnet pair, the discrete one, yeah? So you see, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to come to the smooth uh, uh, limit in this case, but it, uh, it's not necessary to come to the smooth limit. So what is uh, important here, you can look what kind of geometric properties these surfaces have. And you observe uh, two important properties. Uh, on the discrete isothermic torus, which was constructed numerically, you see that the curvature lines with five vertices, they are marked in orange here, are planar. So you see these uh, orange lines, five points are, do not necessarily lie in the plane. But here you see this happens. And uh, this, th these generators in the other direction, which uh, have seven points, they lie on the sphere. And this is a numerical result, yeah? So the result from this optimization. And then, uh, uh, well, why uh, this happens? Right? Why we are so lucky to observe something like this, yeah? Because uh, the discretizations we are using here are integrable discretizations. We preserve the integrability of the system. And this property uh, of a curvature line to be plane or spherical, it has to do with the spectral curve, with the genus of a spectral curve usually. And it, this means simply that the genus of the spectral curve uh, is uh, not so big. Yeah, So maybe two, maybe three, yeah, something like this. Yeah. So, and here, when you have just a few points of your discrete uh, surface, then you still can uh, get uh, genus maybe a little bit higher than three, maybe five, yeah. So, but not twenty, yeah, because you don't have enough points for this. So, and when you then minimize it, uh, you are doing something integrable, and you see that uh, the genus uh, turns out to be low. And this is, of course, a good hint that uh, something similar may happen in the smooth case. And uh, that was the reason how we came to the idea to consider isothermic tori with one family of planar curvature lines. This is a special family. And of course, if you uh, take this family, this will simplify your investigation a lot. So the idea is to take isothermic tori with planar curvature lines and try to, uh, to uh, get a Bonnet pair with this tori. And then, of course, you should look uh, whether uh, something uh, in this direction has been done already, and you find a classification by Darbu uh, from 1883. So he uh, has considered exactly this problem, uh, so not, not, uh, not the global one, but uh, how to classify all isothermic uh, surfaces with one family of planar curvature lines. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to read this paper. It's, uh, it's uh, excellent cal calculations, excellent observations. But uh, the result is as follows. So that every isothermic surface with one family, which we will denote U curves of planar curvature lines, has its planes of all these uh, curvature lines tangent to a cone. In particular, they all intersect in a point. And given by, so now you have the surface and you see there is a curve. 
This is a planar curve, which I'm going to describe. This will be important for us. And it is, it is rotated by some quaternions that depend on D only, on the second variable, uh, which we go in the, in the orthogonal direction. And this phi of D satisfies some ordinary differential equation, which can be written. Yeah. So that's the result of Darboux. And then the idea is, okay, let us take his result and try to get uh, binary surfaces. So this curve, gamma, which is planar curvature line curve, it's given by this formula that's in Darboux. And we immediately recognize that this is uh, the simplest case of uh, this Baker has a function for genus one surface. Yeah, so with uh, essential singularity and so on and so on. The problem is, however, if you look at this formula, uh, then this curve gamma as a function of u is never periodic in u. And that's uh, the end of the story, yeah? So because it is supposed to be a closed curvature line, we are going to construct compact examples. So this means that the Darboux classification contains no cylinders or tori. So there are no closed curves in the U direction. And uh, it was not a problem for him, of course, because he was considering only local problem. Yeah, he has obtained an explicit formula for everything and whether it closes or not, it was not uh, the problem he was investigating. The problem is that he considers elliptic functions on rectangular lattices only. The conformal type of the torus he is considering for, for this elliptic function is a rectangular torus. Yeah, and then there's the formula and it never closes up. Uh, so it turns out that his classification was not complete and it must be extended by including the elliptic functions on rhombic lattices. Yeah, so uh, you consider not only rectangular tori, but also the tori that are rhombic. These are still Riemann surfaces with an anti-holomorphic involution. And if you compare the corresponding formulas for the curves gamma, they are quite similar. So the first one is the formula you find in Darboux. And the second one is a similar formula for this gamma curve uh, when you have a rhombic torus. Well, uh, what is responsible for the periodicity? Why these guys are never periodic in the first case? Because theta four prime never vanishes. And it's a different story with theta two prime. So that's the picture. So zeros of uh, theta two prime for rhombic lattices. So, and uh, it depends on the conformal type of this rhombic lattice. You see, it can be thin and it can be thick, yeah? So, and you see the locations of the zeros of the derivative of theta two uh, uh, function. And we need this zero because, uh, I'm sorry, because you see it, uh, it is our exponential factor and uh, this factor must vanish. Otherwise we have no chance to get the periodic examples. So the recipe is take a rhombic case and take a tau shown here to the left-hand side when you have real zeros of uh, uh, theta two prime, and then you can really proceed uh, with this. So you get a periodic curve. The, the Banach periodicity conditions both A and B simplify. Uh, so the spherical inversion and dualization operators map each plane a uh, curvature line and therefore the entire surface on the minus itself. So there is a lot of symmetry. You see F, F inverse in the dual surfaces, they essentially coincide. And uh, uh, this is the case when F has a family of closed planar curvature lines. So uh, then you obtain the fundamental piece. Maybe I will not uh, explain you all the details in this computation, but uh, so that you simply get a flavor of what is going on. Uh, is the parameterized cylindrical patch. So we already have closed, uh, closed U curves, but probably not closed V curves. And I remind you that the, our surface in the direction of this V uh, in the in the v direction 
is given by a solution of a differential equation which we cannot solve explicitly yeah so it's uh, it's it's not uh, an explicit function and therefore it's rather difficult to control the periodicity but we will come to this so the fundamental piece uh, is parameterized uh, uh, by uh, uh, well is given by f where u is periodic and this parameter v varies from zero to v and uh, we have some reparameterization function which is periodic so here in this picture you see uh, such a fundamental piece and it has an axis uh, you have a frame and uh, when you uh, move your frame along this v curve it gets some monodromy and this monodromy is unitary this is this unitary quaternion and this unitary quaternion has it has its imaginary part and this is euclidean motion yeah so this euclidean motion has a rotation axis uh, so we have a axis a and we have a rotation angle so and then the conditions are so it's a long uh, uh, formulation of the theorem uh, but uh, we uh, get uh, we have an isothermic uh, cylinder with one family of uh, u-curves of closed planar curvature lines and with periodic reparameterization function it gives us a fundamental uh, piece with axis a and generating rotation angle theta uh, so now we have its gauss mechan metric so then the resulting Bonnet pair cylinders are tora if and only if well, we have a rational rotation angle, so that's uh, quite natural because we would like to get our isothermic torus, uh, torus. and also vanishing uh, XL B part, which uh, which is a little bit more tricky uh, formula. Um, okay, it's difficult to treat this uh, problem in all its generality, and therefore we pass now to a, a special case when we have the second family of spherical curvature lines. You may remember that in the discrete case, I had only not one family of planar curvature lines, but also the second family of spherical curvature lines. So now we say we want to have them in our smooth case. And if you do this, then we can treat this uh, problem analytically completely. So the periodicity conditions can be refined when the uh, second family of curvature lines is spherical, uh, uh, and moreover, both periodicity conditions are given as abelian integrals. Let me show you the final result for this uh, uh, abelian integrals. So they are all uh, abelian integrals on an elliptic curve. So this is uh, these are elliptic integrals, and uh, both conditions can be written explicitly. So our parameters, we have parameters, the branch points on these curves, and so on and so on. So maybe I will not go into details here because it's already rather technical. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, parameters and the theorem is then, uh, uh, so as soon as these two conditions are satisfied, we have a Bonnet uh, cylinders that are tori in this case. So we uh, have them. So what to do, how to uh, study this? Of course, you look what happens numerically and you see you can you have solutions, but we also would like to prove the mathematical theorem that uh, it has uh, solutions. And then there is a natural parameter delta. You take an asymptotics when delta goes to zero and then you can treat this uh, really precisely. So mathematically and prove this theorem that uh, solutions do exist. So, okay, so this theorem, we can solve these periodicity conditions, we can prove that the, the solutions exist. Okay, so uh, now you see the result. So these are compact Bonnet pairs from isothermic tori with plane and spherical curvature lines. This is the fundamental piece and uh, two boundary planar boundary curves uh, 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 the planes of them intersect at 120 degrees angle. So this means that you should take three copies, glue them together, and you get this torus. So that's what uh, happens here. 
uh, and that's a demonstration that the, the Bonnet pairs uh, uh, really are not congruent. And that's the surface with this threefold symmetry. Uh, okay, they look similar. And then the question is, maybe it's the same surface, actually. Yeah, so we uh, spent a lot of time uh, and uh, uh, there is no guarantee that this is not uh, the same surface. And it turns out that it is the same surface. So uh, it's, of course, a rather disappointing thing. So, but the surface possesses an intrinsic isometry. You map one half of the surface to another half. This, uh, this, is, this uh, intrinsic isometry is not an ex ex extrinsic isometry. It's not a motion in R3. And the mean curvature function is preserved. So in a way, it, it is a Bonnet uh, family. But of course, one would like to have really two different surfaces. And this can be done as well. So that's uh, the corresponding isothermic torus. And that's uh, the fundamental piece and uh, full uh, isothermic surface. In another case, when we have four-fold symmetry, so of course you you have many examples now, and that's uh, uh, that's a claim that these two surfaces are mirror images of each other, and the mirror symmetry mapping f plus to f minus is not the mean curvature preserving isometry. Okay, so but now what you can do, you can take these examples and consider small per small perturbation already of these examples and prove that a small perturbation exists that makes these two surfaces really non-congruent. There are two different surfaces with the same metric and with, uh, uh, with the same mean curvature function. That's smooth uh, analytic proof uh, by a small uh, perturbation. One more step, step in, in, in this proof. So, okay. So that's uh, the... Uh, the picture which uh, you should uh, look at, and this shows us the existence of our, our Bonnet uh, family. So now uh, I'm done with these Bonnet pairs, and how much time do I have? Do I have 10 minutes? Uh, yes, about that, maybe uh -huh. nine. Okay, <laughs> good. So, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, this is a new- uh, But Sasha, probably- yeah. It would be a good idea to leave a couple of minutes for the questions. Yeah, okay, yeah. We have 15 minute break between talks technically. So if we okay. borrow five minutes from that, that's okay. Yeah, if you have uh, some short questions now, please ask, yeah. So, yeah, so here it's, the new result is that now we know that these Bonnet, compact Bonnet pairs do exist, yeah, and know how to construct them. Sasha, I have a question, maybe. Yeah. It's not so short, but okay. To satisfy periodicity condition, you need to prove that certain transcendental equation for period of abelian integrals um, are equal to some rational numbers or whatever. Yeah. It's usually it's very hard to control, of course. If you have a solution, you can deform, but uh, you prove it through discretization or there is some minimizing functional for which these equation mm -hmm. are minimal so you can prove in this way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the discretization was used just to come to this uh, conclusion that they do probably exist and they probably, the corresponding tori have planar curvature lines. So that was a geometric idea which came from this numerical experiment. But uh, we, of course, all the proofs do not use discretization. So the proofs are purely analytic. And how do we investigate these transcendental equations? So there are parameters there. And uh, in particular, some parameter delta, which uh, you see, you have an elliptic curve. Look at the second line from, the, from below, yeah? So your elliptic curve depends on delta. And you can... Uh, uh, you can uh, consider the limit when the delta goes to zero. In this case, your elliptic curves, you, you see, it degenerates. So the branch points come together in pairs, and then you can really investigate uh, this limit analytically, what happens to these two conditions in this limit. And then you are using just an implicit function theorem 
to prove that there exist solutions for delta small enough. So that's the analytic proof here. Yeah, so implicit function theory and uh, uh, analytic investigation of this limit. So that's, that's enough. Uh, that, that's what uh, is written here, <laughs> proof of existence by synthetic analysis. I have omitted, of course, all the formulas, but they are in the paper, yeah? Okay, so, thank you. Thank yeah, you. and uh, in this case, you prove the existence of such surfaces, but after that, we would like to get two different surfaces of this example, and then <coughs> it's one more perturbation step. So with uh, some uh, also implicit function theorem, and uh, small perturbation now with functional parameter. So, but uh, it's it's completely proven that no discretization is used. For the Thank proof. you. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And uh, just in the remaining five minutes, I will uh, shortly mention the third case. Uh, same problem, uh, but we have one parameter family of isometries, preserving the metric, uh, preserving the metric, of course, because they are isometries, and preserving their mean curvature function. So uh, we consider one parameter families of non-constant mean curvature surfaces, uh, and then uh, an umbilic free surface is a Banner surface, uh, even only if it is an isothermic surface. I have explained what does it mean, and one over Q is harmonic. So that's a classical result, uh, which uh, which is actually more or less due to Bonnet maybe himself, but uh, in this way it's formulated by Graustein. So, and there was a local classification uh, of Bonnet families. Uh, also, many people were involved, but uh, I think the uh, final classification is due to Eli Kalkan in '42, who has shown that. Uh, this fog differential can be brought to these three different forms with sine, with sinh, and with one over t squared. And uh, the mean curvature function should satisfy this uh, ordinary differential equation. It's important. Now we have an ordinary differential in contrast to the partial differential equations we had for Bernay families. So it's written here, and this is a so-called Hatzidakis equation, ordinary differential equation of the third order. You can integrate it twice, it once. So essentially, it's a, uh, an equation of the second order. So then, uh, how to obtain uh, these uh, isometric deformations? It's a it's a remarkable thing that you need only one surface, it, and this is a shift on the surface. So you have uh, parameterization, uh, conformal parameterization of your surface with this parameter w, which can be explicitly computed using this harmonicity of the Hopf differential and so on, one of the few of the Hopf differential. And then if you shift on the surface in the imaginary direction, then it's an isometry and the mean curvature is preserved. So this means that the mean curvature depends on one parameter only. Yeah, and how it depends on this parameter is, is presented, uh, is explained by this equation. So then, uh, it turns out that this is also an integrable system. And to see this, yeah, you change these parameters a little bit and observe that if you write down now the frame of your surface in terms of two parameters, X and lambda, that are uh, presented here, then you obtain a system like this. You see it. Uh, uh, it's a system of two linear equations that are compatible and they coefficients uh, depend on lambda in a very specific way. So you see it's a, uh, it's a Fuchsian system with uh, uh, four regular singularities and the, and the equation for X uh, uh, tells you that you are considering isomonodromic deformations. So the compatibility condition for the system is this Hatzidakis equation, which is uh, in terms of this coordinate is written in this way. So in as soon as you see this, of course you think Pendelier. Yeah, so that's a classical monodromy problem for Pendelier six. And therefore this problem can be solved completely in terms of uh, Pendelier equations. So a lot of computations, 
This is the form of the Pendeva 6 equation, which uh, comes from here. You see, I haven't written the formulas for all these coefficients b, but that's uh, not very important. They are geometric. They depend on our geometric properties of our geometric values. But as soon as you have this structure, you do have Pendeva 6. Yeah. So uh, for any solution of the Pendeva 6 equation, this function h, which is written in terms of this Pendeva 6 equation, uh, solves the Hatsidakis equation. And moreover, you have not only the solution to this equation, but also the frame. Yeah. So because the frame is uh, given to you by this uh, monodromy problem. So similar formulas you can get for Bonnet families C in terms of 10 to 5. As I said, you uh, in this classification of Cartan, we have three cases, A, B, and C. A and B analytically are quite similar. They uh, lead to 10 to 6, and the case C uh, leads to uh, 10 to 5. So uh, I'm th I think I'm quite good in time, and this is my last slide. So in this case, you can get a global classification. As I said, this classification of uh, Katan is local, and now you can uh, globally classify these uh, Banet families, uh, including even uh, critical points, which were uh, not possible in this local, local classification. So they, uh, topologically, they are uh, either an open stripe or a half plane or disk. There are three cases. And uh, here in this picture, you see uh, uh, you see the examples of so-called maximal immersions of Banet families of types uh, types A, B, and C. And maybe the last uh, sentence is: Look, uh, for example, at the surface uh, in the middle. You see that uh, uh, okay, the, the parameter lines, the distances between the parameter lines are constant. So this is exactly what happens to your surface. If you shift along these parameter lines in the direction of these yellow lines, then it's an isometry. And moreover, the mean curvature is preserved. OK, so uh, these are two cases where you can really use uh, the integrability theory to solve uh, two classical uh, uh, problems in uh, the surface theory. So thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for your talk. Uh, questions, remarks? Uh, may I ask, probably I'll miss the point. In Elise's Cartan classification, there were two uh, periodic like soliton and hyperbolic soliton uh, potentials and they generated to the Kaloger Moser type thing. Is it about uh, periodic in one direction and global solutions? So, my question is Is there a classification of similar type for Torah, where there probably should be some elliptic function involved? No, no, you see, it's, a, it's an ordinary differential equation. It's Pendeve. It's really Pendeve. So uh, you have a, a function of one variable t, and that's it, yeah? So- uh, No, the question is function of one variable, but uh, is it one, periodic in one direction, like sine and sinh complex, or it's periodic in two? Because it, it's miramorph, it's function of one variable. So there are no elliptic ca no. cases in all. No. The, there is no elliptic case. That's all. That's all. The, these are these are not special cases. This is a complete classification. So you start with this property that Q uh, one over Q is harmonic and the surface uh, is uh, isothermic. This means that Q is uh, real valued in terms of this coordinates, and then you can come to this. So by doing some analysis, that's what Cartan did, and Chern after him. Thank you. More questions? If not, then Can I ask you a question? <laughs> oh, please, Peter. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question. So, uh, Sasha, thanks for your talk. It was really great to hear it and to see you as well. Um, so, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned at the end uh, you sometimes get the 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 two copies of the same surface, and then there's an additional perturbation argument that you use to separate them. Can you say a little bit more about that? Mm. 
you see, uh, we, uh, of course, uh, construct examples. Yeah. So, and this example, which we have constructed first, which was based on the isothermic torus with one family of plane and one family of uh, spherical curvature line, it was too symmetric. So we have obtained the Barnett pair. So these two surfaces possess, there is a mapping between them. And this mapping is not a Euclidean rotation. It, uh, the surfaces are not congruent in this sense. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this is an isometry, and this isometry preserves, uh, preserves the uh, mean curvature function. But if you look at these surfaces as compact tori, it turns out to be the same surface, just uh, reflected uh, in, in, with mirror reflection. Still, this mapping of one part to, of the surface to another, which is our intrinsic isometry, is non-trivial map. It's not just the Euclidean rotation. But it's the same surface. And then we would like, uh, we wanted to have really two different surfaces. Yeah, in principle, it's not required. It's already an example of a Banner, uh, Banner torus. But the next question was whether you can get them really different so that uh, there is no this mirror reflection. And then you just put up them a little bit and prove that such a perturbation exists. And uh, numerically, you can, you can construct it anyway. I see, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there more questions or remarks? If not, then just we have seven minutes break, maybe six.